Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so glad that you have decided to join us for worship today. Our community is blessed by your presence. If you haven't already and you are worshiping with us live on our online platform, I encourage you to say hello uh, because it's such a blessing to me and the other worshipers to know that you are here and with us today. Uh, i got a couple of announcements for you while you do that, uh, and it's all centered around Easter weekend, which is coming up in just a few weeks. We are preparing at this time for Easter, and so it's a very exciting time. Uh, Easter is on the 9th of April, and Easter is always a lot of fun. We have a big celebration. We do an Easter egg hunt for the kids after church, and so I encourage you uh, to bring the kids with their Easter baskets, and after church, uh, they can have their egg hunt. Uh, we will also be having our Good Friday worship here at the church at 7 p.m. on the 7th. Uh, 7th is the day that we remember the crucifixion of Jesus and helps us prepare uh, for the joy of the resurrection. And so I hope you will join us for that as well. Uh, other than that, I'm just glad you're here with us. And I would invite you now to join me in saying the things that unite us here as a church family, because it is by saying these things that we are reminded who we are and what we are all about. So here we go. Here at Connect Church, our mission is to connect to God and connect to others. And our vision is to share the transforming power of Christ by creating a community set on making a difference in the world by living out Christ's three greats, the great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The commandment of great compassion. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And while these are the things that unite us here at Connect Church, we are also united with Christians around the world. And so each week we join their voices uh, and ours together in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now if you will join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so very much for being the God that you are. We ask that you send your spirit into this place, that you would inspire us and transform us, allow us to worship you today. Fill us up with your presence. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Praise to the Lord, beside Him there's no other. Give thanks to the Lord, His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord, beside Him there's no other. Rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from mourning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? La 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 la. Come on and praise the Lord. La 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 Hear the word of the Lord There's freedom for the captives Good news to the poor And beauty for the ashes So what are we waiting for? And be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from mourning to dancing, 
from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? La 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 la. Come on and praise the Lord. La 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 la. What are we waiting for? La 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 la. Come on and praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I live, I live to tell what the Lord has done. I live to sing of my Savior's love. I live because He is risen. La, 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 la. La 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 This is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it This is the day the Lord has made Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it This is the day the Lord has made Oh Rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from morning to dancing, from glory to glory, from morning to dancing, from glory to glory, from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? La 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 la. Come on and praise the Lord. La 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 What are we waiting for? La 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 Come on and praise the Lord
Good morning and welcome to Connect Church Online. My name is Rhiannon Sisk and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the growing chairperson here at Connect United Methodist Church. I'm going to be filling in for Adam Ricks this week. He's having a little bit of a spring break break. Hopefully he got some better weather than we did this week. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about seeing ourselves in the Bible. And I want to use one of my favorite Bible stories to talk to you about that. And that is the story of Samson. Not the story of Samson and Delilah, which of course is very popular, but I want to just talk about Samson. We've been talking about discernment here at Connect United Methodist these last few weeks, and as Adam has mentioned, an important part of discernment is hearing from God. We all know that reading the Bible and studying God's Word is one way to hear from God, but I've been speaking to some of you and it seems like we sometimes have a hard time knowing how reading the Bible can help us hear from God. It's not as simple as just opening it to a random page and reading what you find there. It's not as simple as Googling your problem and seeing the answer from the Bible writ large across your screen. It does require effort and it requires a familiarity with the Bible. When I was a child, about five years old, um, Samson was one of the very first stories that I read to myself from the Bible. It wasn't the actual Bible, it was the Golden Children's Bible, the one with the illustrations. And I loved this story for all the wrong reasons. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of the things I loved about the story and the way that I saw it then. As I see it, Samson comes to life when he kills a lion with his bare hands. And then he goes back to the carcass of that lion and eats some honey. He marries a woman. She gets killed, and so he lights some fields on fire by tying together 300 foxes and lighting the foxes on fire. And then he kills a thousand men with a donkey jawbone. He gets betrayed by a dumb woman, and then he gets revenge by crashing a building down on the heads of his enemies. It was like a superhero story to my five-year-old mind. I loved the illustrations. But I think what I really identified with at that time was I felt like Samson won in the end. I felt like he had been wronged so many times, and each time he was wronged, he was able to get his revenge. And then at the end of the day, even though he died, I felt like he won by crashing that building down on the heads of his enemies. Now, clearly, I might have had some anger issues, (laughs) even as a child. But the magic of the Bible is that when I read that story now, I see something entirely different. And when I say magic, I don't mean voodoo, I don't mean black magic. I mean that this is a magical document and that it can speak to us in different ways at different times of our lives. So one of the things that we can do when we read the Bible, and one of the ways that we can find guidance from the Bible, is when we remember that it is twice inspired. That means it is twice infused with divine essence. And when I say that, I mean it was divinely inspired when the people were writing it down and it's divinely inspired again when you read it and you interpret it. One of the ways that we can hear from God through the Bible is to look at the similarities between our lives and the lives of people in the Bible. This can be difficult to do sometimes, especially with the Old Testament. Um, Sometimes we hear these stories a hundred times when we're growing up, and even if we're new to church as an adult, we can hear these stories and they can seem fantastical and mythical. And then sometimes when we read the New Testament, we're not given as many details about someone's lives, so it can be hard to see them as a whole person. But what I would encourage you to do when you read these stories is something that I've learned to do as an adult, and that is to look for the similarities between these people and myself. To look for the similarities between their lives, even though they took place so long ago, and my life today. And I have found that when I look at the similarities instead of the differences, I can read a story that's hundreds or thousands of years old and I can find the answer to my problems today. And so what I would like to do is encourage you to look at the story of Samson with me today because today the story of Samson isn't one of anger and revenge. The story of Samson is one of redemption. Redemption means saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. It means deliverance and it means rescue. Today, what I see in the story of Samson is God redeeming a very flawed and broken human being. I see all of us in his story. I see myself in that story. His story is full of humanity, and it is so relatable. 
So now I want to take a deeper dive into some aspects of the story that can speak to us about redemption in the face of our mistakes and our shortcomings today. And I do want you to bear with me today because I'm going to throw a little more scripture at you than what we normally do. Um, But I hope that you'll stick with me through it. First of all, from before his birth, Samson was chosen by God for a special purpose. That purpose was to free the Israelites from the Philistines. And as God often does in the Old Testament, he sends an angel to tell Samson's mother about the purpose for her son. In Judges chapter 13, we learn that the people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hands of the Philistines. I do want to stop here for just a minute and talk about what it means to be a Nazarite because it's really important to the story of Samson. Um, I do love history, and I hope that you guys do too, um, because not only does Samson have to save the nation of Israel, as we're told in this verse, he also has to follow some pretty strict rules. Being a Nazarite means that you are set apart. So in addition to following all the rules of being a member of the Jewish nation, Samson has additional rules to follow. He is an Israelite who's consecrated to the service of God, and he's under vows to abstain from alcohol, to let his hair grow, and to avoid defilement by contact with corpses. So while Samson is given a great purpose, he's also given some pretty strict rules to follow. And I want to tell you that here, Samson is already just like the rest of us. It may seem fantastical that the Lord sent an angel to tell his mother that he had a special purpose for him, but I would submit to each of you that every single one of you has a special purpose set out by God. Jeremiah 29 11 tells us, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray and I will listen to you. This verse and many others like it in the Bible tell us that God has set out a purpose for each one of us. He doesn't always send an angel to tell our mothers what that purpose is, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a purpose. Each one of us is God's child, and so we have a purpose just like Samson had a purpose. And God has given us the Bible to set out the rules for our existence just like he gave Samson the rules of being a Nazarite. The promises that Samson made were vows to God. And these promises are not unlike the promises we make to God when we become a Christian and when we vow to live a Christian life. We mean the promises when we make them, and sometimes life catches up with us and we find ourselves behaving in a manner that's not consistent with those promises, or we put ourselves in situations that are not consistent with those promises. The same thing happened to Samson, and Samson broke his vows. So we learn in Judges chapter 14 that sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I will become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then, with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, All this time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me, so tell me how you can be tied. 
He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head and wove them into the fabric and tightened it with the pen. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and pulled the pen and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God for my mother's wound. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. There is so much we can relate to here. Samson falls in love, and haven't we all? He's not just giving lip service to the fact that he loves Delilah. He actually falls in love with her to the point that he wants to keep her happy. She wouldn't have any power over him to keep nagging him and to get his secret if he didn't actually love her. And so what Samson does here is he puts Delilah and his love for her above his love for God. He tries to keep her happy, and so he lies to her and he tries to put her off, but she just will not stop. The Bible literally says, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. She nearly nagged him to death in order to get him to tell her. And I'm sure I could make a lot of jokes about women and their nagging here, but I don't care for those jokes. So I will just say, imagine a time when you felt like that. Think of when your children were little or when you had a sibling and that child wanted something. They wanted it so bad, they would not let go of it. They would not let go of the idea of it. And they just kept asking and asking and asking. They wanted it so bad, they said, if you love me, you will do it. I think we can all relate to what Samson was going through there. And so he finally relents. Instead of trusting in God and asking God to give him the strength to withstand and keep his vow to never cut his hair, he relies on his own wits to solve the problem. He loves Delilah so much that he wants to keep her happy, and so he attempts to do that by lying to her. That doesn't work, and so eventually he tells her the truth. Instead of asking God for help, instead of asking God to strengthen him in his vow, he betrays God and he gives up his secret. And if the analogy of the child coming after you again and again asking for something doesn't work for you, think of another situation in your life. Maybe it was your own desire that kept nagging at you. Maybe it was something you wanted so bad you couldn't stand it. You couldn't give up the idea of it. And so eventually you gave in and you got that thing. But you knew immediately that you had done the wrong thing. Or maybe it's society. Maybe it's pressure around you, peer pressure at work, peer pressure from your friends that got you to do something that you weren't comfortable doing, but you didn't know what else to do. And in the moment, you didn't think of calling on God. You instead relied on your own ability to make a decision and your own thoughts, and it turned out to be the wrong choice. The other thing that he did here was he relied on that person that he loved so much to protect him and to do the right thing. I think we can all relate to that as well. There are times when we have loved someone so much that we've relied on them to keep us safe. We've relied on them to make decisions for us that may not have worked out in the right way. We've relied on a human being rather than relying on God. This is what Samson did here. He couldn't keep his promise to the Lord of his own strength. And so he instead relied on his mind and he relied on other people instead of asking the Lord for help. And Samson is far from the only person in the Bible to find himself in this situation. In the New Testament, we have Peter who tells Jesus he will not betray him. Yet a few hours later, there he is betraying Jesus. In Matthew 26, 31, Jesus told them, The very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if I fall away, if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. 
But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples did the same. Peter made a promise that he wasn't capable of keeping on his own either. But in the heat of the moment, Peter forgot about God. He forgot to pray and ask for help. He forgot to surround himself with the right type of people. And he ended up betraying Jesus, just like Samson ended up breaking his vows to the Lord. They acted on the strength of themselves and out of fear of others rather than relying on God. In Samson's case, just as in Peter's, the result was disastrous. In Judges 16, verses 18 through 22, we learn that when Delilah saw he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, they gouged out his eyes, and they took him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze shackles, and they set him to grinding grain in the prison, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Samson at first doesn't realize the gravity of what's happened here, and I think that that is very relatable. Sometimes we make these decisions, and we're going to have to deal with the consequences, but it's not immediately apparent to us what the consequences of our actions are. And sometimes you can't see those consequences when you're still down in the weeds of the situation. Samson assumes that he will not be harmed. He thought that he could trust Delilah, and even when he found out she had betrayed him, he thought, I'll just shake myself free like I did in the past. I've got this, right? But Samson needed God to help him with that, and God had departed because of Samson's breaking of the vow. Now, this is not about God punishing Samson. Um, I think sometimes when we look at the Old Testament, and I'm guilty of this as well, we often see God punishing people. It's not always a punishment so much as it is the natural consequences of the action. Samson allowed to happen what he swore would not happen. He didn't ask for God's help before it, and he didn't ask for God's help yet after it. And so he has to deal with the consequences of his actions. His strength leaves him, but that's not enough. They gouge out his eyes. They blind him. They take him down to Gaza, and they bind him with bronze shackles. And in our world, this doesn't mean a lot, but in Samson's world, bronze was not a very strong metal. So they didn't even need the strongest metal to bind him anymore. And they send him to grind grain in the prison. So Samson is brought as low as he could be brought. He's physically wounded. He cannot see. He doesn't have his strength. He's not surrounded by anyone who loves him. It tells us God had left him. And that is because Samson made choices of his own volition and he did not rely on the Lord. He is humbled. He is brought down the lowest he can be. And this is what it took for Samson to again rely on the Lord. We all have terrible decisions that we have made and we all have the worst things that we have ever done. These are different things to different people, but sometimes we have to make those poor decisions and we have to be brought down as low as we can be brought, as low as it takes to make us cry out to the Lord. So once Samson is brought this low, he is still going to be defiled further. So in Judges chapter 16, we learn that the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain. While they are in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison and he performed for them. He's gone from a strong man who is a judge of Israel to a prisoner who's been blinded, who doesn't require much to be bound, and now he's being called out in front of his enemies to perform for them. 
he could not get any lower. So when they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can fill the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please God, strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against him, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple and the rulers and all the people in it. He killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel for 20 years. Finally, when Samson is at his lowest, when he can't take it anymore, he cries out to the Lord. And here at last is the redemption of Samson. And here is how we can see how we will be redeemed as well. Samson has betrayed the purpose for which God set him apart. He's betrayed the vows that he made to God, and he has fallen as far as it is possible for him to fall. He relied on his own understanding. He relied on the human that he loved rather than relying on God and fulfilling God's mission for for him. He forgot about the Lord. And it wasn't until Samson was brought to this lowest point that he cries out to the Lord in desperation. He is so desperate for the Lord's help at that point that he's willing to die. And so he asks God to remember him, to strengthen him once more, and to allow him one more blow to get revenge on the Philistines. And what we see here is that God does not ignore Samson's cry. God forgives what has gone before. He hears Samson's cry, and he does as Samson asks him. He allowed Samson to fulfill his purpose, despite Samson getting off the trail, despite Samson doing the wrong thing time and again, despite his anger, despite his love for Delilah, and despite his forgetting about God, when he cries out to God, God hears him. And what this story says to me today is it doesn't matter how far you have gotten from God. It doesn't matter what terrible things you might have done. It doesn't matter what the lowest point in your life is. Because when you are at that lowest point, and when you think God has forgotten about you, you can still cry out to the Lord, and he will hear you, he will forgive you, and he will redeem you. And so I would encourage you as you go out this week to pray about the places in the Bible that you can see yourself. Pray to God for that guidance so that when you read the stories that are in the Bible, you can say, hey, there's a person just like me. Samson might have lived a long time ago, but he made the same mistakes that we all make. But he was chosen by the Lord just like each one of you is chosen by the Lord. And so I would encourage you to see yourself in these stories. And when you need the wisdom, you can go to the Bible and you can say, hey, I've done a lot of dumb things lately. I might have done some terrible things. I might have surrounded myself with people I shouldn't surround myself with. I may have given in to desires I shouldn't have given in to. But at the end of the day, if I cry out to the Lord for help, if I stop trying to solve my problems for myself, the Lord will hear me, the Lord will redeem me, and the Lord will bless me. If you would pray with me now. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word today. Please be with one of us as we go out this week. Please allow us to see ourselves reflected in your word. Please allow us to be inspired by your word so that we may hear from you through your word. And now we say the prayer that you once taught us in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven daily bread, and forgive us our
trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that we've received the word of God, we have an opportunity in this moment to respond, in particular, to respond through our giving. So I would encourage you now to click on the link on the online worship platform and do your online giving. And by reacting or or responding through generosity, you and I, as disciples of Jesus Christ, get to experience what it's like to participate in God's ministry to the world. And so I encourage you now to do your giving uh, and to know that God will use our service to bless others. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to them and he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do it, remember me. And so for nearly 2,000 years, Christians around the world have gathered together to experience God's grace in this way, and we do it today once again, knowing that God is present, and that we will experience God's grace. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make that be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen. I'd like to invite those who are assisting to serve communion to come forward at this time as you're prepared to receive. Um, here at Connect Church, we practice what we call open table, which means that everyone here, both children and adults, are invited to come and receive communion. When you come forward, we'll be doing it by uh, our normal method, which means you'll place your hands out like this. They'll take a piece of bread, place it into your hand. You go ahead and consume that, and then you get your small individual communion cup, and you can take that as well. After receiving communion, uh, you're invited to peel off and go to one of the prayer rails, uh, spend a little bit of time in prayer with the Lord. Whatever it is that you need to speak to God about, um, He's here meeting you and ready. This is God's table, and each and every one of you are welcome and invited to find His peace. So please come as you feel.
His arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. As you depart from this place today, I encourage you to go in peace, to know that God has a plan for you. But no matter where you go and what you do, I also want you to know above all things that God loves you, that God forgives you. So go now in peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.